Yes, looks like we're live. Oh, <laughs> well, hey, sorry we had some technical difficulties there. Deep um, state. <laughs> totally the deep state. Totally. Um, I'm Cassandra Fairbanks. I'll be hanging out with you guys for the next couple hours on this segment of the Unity for J stream. Good morning. And I'll be Jack Wasobic. <laughs> here with my dear friend Jack. And we're going to talk about why WikiLeaks is so important. Um, so, how did you how did you get into WikiLeaks? Were you always into WikiLeaks, or did it be, you know come re more recently? So, I definitely have I think a different take on my journey to kind of understanding WikiLeaks, or at least as I've come to understand them now, than most people because. Um, if other folks um, don't know my background, so I was like, you did a bad job introducing you. <laughs> you know, a member, I was like a member of the deep state before. So currently I work for One American News. I'm a host there out of the DC Bureau. And prior to that, I was an intelligence officer, DIA, ONI, uh, through the US Navy. And when you're in that world, and when I did that for many years, you know, and Look, we do a lot of great work. We do a lot of awesome things. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that's questionable, that gets swept under the rug and nobody ever finds out about it. Um, what we're taught about WikiLeaks in that world is, is that WikiLeaks is, you know, uh, traitors, that WikiLeaks is evil, that, you know, WikiLeaks is trying to take down every government in the world, that our enemies are um, you know, colluding with WikiLeaks to to go after the U.S. military, to go after all these different things, and that they're just against America. And so you have to hate WikiLeaks and you have to hate Julian Assange because they're anti-American, right? And honestly, that's, you know, what you get kind of taught. And I never really thought about it much. I said, okay, whatever, like, I just have work to do and I don't, I, I don't have time to deal with, like, some website, right? And... But the thing that always kind of stuck in my mind was and I said, well, when I would think about the issue was, well, wait a minute, this website had published classified information at the time and later, uh, later on uh, emails that were, you know, were very uh, sensitive to, to U.S. politics. But I said, well, they published classified information. I said, well, I don't understand what the difference is between this website doing that and the New York Times doing it, the Washington Post doing it. Uh, senators and congressmen going out and doing it from, you know, in, in Washington saying, uh, you know, just revealing classified information, classified operations. So I didn't quite understand why it was that this one website uh, and one publisher was being singled out when all the rest of people were doing it anyway. So from my perspective, it was very confusing that why we were singling out this one person and one group and not everyone else. And as I, uh, you know, I guess we would use the term red pilled these days, but as I got more and more uh, understanding of what was going on in our own government and learning more about the corruption, the cover ups, when I saw cover ups with my own eyes, stuff that, you know, I can't talk about because I was in, involved in it operationally, and I never have, but just seeing how information was withheld from the U.S. government, or excuse me, the U.S. public or the, the world public writ large, it started to make me very upset. Um, I would honestly say, oh, one, one that, that people would know very well, uh, doesn't necessarily involve uh, WikiLeaks, but would be Benghazi. And I say that from a perspective of, people know by now what Benghazi was and that it was a terrorist attack and that it, you know, it was this massive failure of the U.S. government, but we also, officials, lied about it in real time. They blamed it on YouTube, they blamed it on a filmmaker, they put this guy in jail for it. It was just complete lies and cover up. And we all knew, we all knew that they were lying every single day and it, it, it drove me nuts because I could see it with my own two eyes, the, the amount of lying and the amount of covering up, the amount of playing politics with, um, with national security, and just not telling people what was actually happening in the world because it fit political interests, not national interests, not the, the public good. And so at that point, I started to ask the question, 
well, does it make sense to expose corruption? Is exposing corruption an ideal, a virtue that people should want to achieve? And I say, well, that's, I mean, that's what all the other publishers always say they're doing, right? They say they're exposing corruption. That's what democracy dies in darkness, right? And so that's kind of the point where I got to realize that, you know what? We do need people to call, um, to call out this corruption, to expose that corruption. And if that's something that these guys are doing, then you know what? Maybe we deserve it. That maybe the government deserved it. And maybe we'll be better off. We won't get in the, into situations like Iraq again, over lies. We won't get to have situations where, um, you know, assassinations take place and we blame it on, you know, people that didn't do it. So that really changed my mind on what WikiLeaks was and what Julian Assange, uh, Assange's work was. I do have a special guest. Uh, if I think if I can if I can bring a special guest on, I don't, I don't know if that's if that's okay to like kind of like yes, check yes, the, yes. the live stream. Real quick. Is, is this the baby? Are you coming uh, on or is this, is this the, the internet debut? <laughs> uh, well, I, I guess I think in terms of a video, yeah. All right, so we have here my three-week-old son. This is Jack Jr. <laughs> he just woke up and he just had his breakfast here in DC. And if you can see his shirt right there, it's the Heart WikiLeaks shirt. Which you can get <laughs> at WikiLeaks shop. <laughs> if you go so to he's hanging out. Mom, WikiLeaks mom, shop. Mom, mom's here too. She's, she's not coming on the live stream this morning. <laughs> oh. Where is she? No, mommy had a long night. <laughs> Mom, mommy had a long night of uh, taking care I'm of this. I'm so guy, glad so. that it fits oh. him. Yay. <laughs> oh, no, it fits perfectly. Yeah. You'll be able to wear it for a couple more uh, weeks, I think. Yeah, I'll be able to wear it for a couple more weeks. He keeps, he's been growing so fast. He's, it's amazing. Now, he has not exposed any government corruption yet personally, but I think probably within the next couple of weeks, it'll happen. It'll well, totally it's, happen. It's so his, important. His Twitter that we account is pretty children. woke. His Twitter account is so woke. My daughter always says, whenever anybody mentions WikiLeaks, she's always like, why are they getting in trouble for telling the truth? And it's such a, it's a thing that we teach our children. Like, you don't get yeah. in trouble for telling the truth. And you should always be honest. And, yeah. And she just can't wrap her head around it because she's grown up with me. And <laughs> we talk about WikiLeaks a lot in this house. And she's just appalled by it. And she's seven years old. And I'm like, why can't adults understand this very basic concept? And that's a great point is in that it's, it's ha, there's never been a time where they've had to issue a correction. There's never been a time where they've had to say, oh, I'm sorry. You know, that, that headline that we put out was completely false. Um, compare that to any media organization out there that's, that constantly has to issue corrections and updates all the time. Uh, and everything they put out, the content. And so I get it. I get that people can be very upset with how did they get their content? What was their source? How did, what would this happen? And I get that people can be upset when potentially their dirty laundry is put out on, on air. Um, but at the same time, it's all true. And so shouldn't the more important thing be what is the content of what they're exposing, what they're reporting? not the way by which they reported it. And so recently I actually got a chance to talk to Sarah Palin of all people at a, uh, at a fundraiser here in DC. And I asked her about this and I said, you know, you've had your, uh, <laughs> your, your uh, you know, little backstory with WikiLeaks. So they had um, released some of her emails at one point and she was, you know, very upset about it. And, you know, just, just shooting mad about, about it coming out because, you know, nobody enjoys that <laughs> right. uh, when, it, when it happens. But then, she said, and this was very big of her, I think, she said that as she thought about it more and as she realized what the mission of WikiLeaks and Assange was to hold those in power accountable, she said, you know what? Even though I didn't enjoy it when it was happening to me, I think that that kind of mission needs to happen. And that kind of mission is the essence of true journalism. Right. And it's so important. People always forget this. They, you know, they're always like, you know, WikiLeaks is so biased now. They're going after just the Democrats. But 
they conveniently leave out the fact that Sarah Palin also had her emails published. You know, yeah, she's, she's um, definitely not a Democrat. Huh? Can't confirm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the whole thing is just insane to me because it's really an attack on the free press. I mean, under the Bartnecki First Amendment test, everything that they publish is protected because they're not the ones who stole the information. And so what they're, what the Democratic Party with their lawsuit and everybody, what they're doing by going after them is attacking the First Amendment and the right to publish. Um, you know, they're, they're in trouble for building sources, which is exactly what you should be doing if you're a publisher or a writer or a reporter. Um, I, I can't think of any anyone who works in this industry who hasn't tried to build sources or obtain information. That's how the news works. So everything that they're being accused of is pretty standard practice. And I feel like people aren't taking it seriously necessarily if they don't agree with the leaks that came out in 2016, but you know, their favorite publisher could be next. I mean, yeah, you know, we've got a situation where just in the past year or so, I would I would point out um, The Intercept and Glenn Greenwald, who mm -hmm. has a very similar model. And there were times where uh, one NSA um, employee, this uh, reality winner, and another FBI employee, forget the guy's name off the top of my head, but they had they had both leaked documents, classified documents to to The Intercept. Um, they were both caught and they were both charged for it. But at no point has anyone said that we need to charge the intercept or, or go after Glenn Greenwald, who, you know, does not live in the U S um, and, and put good. Him under we don't want them to. <laughs> right. And so and we don't want them to, but so I, again, it's, it's, what is the, seriously, what is the difference and what is the, the legal basis for this? What is the standard that we're setting? And is there anything different that they are doing from what's been done over here? No. And it's just that one person has been singled out for, you know, essentially uh, selective prosecution or selective, uh, I would say selective uh, secret or, you know, suspected prosecution at this point, because we don't even know, you know, if there's, if there's any prosecution going on, because, you know, we had this, this Democrat, um, Adam Schiff just mentioned, because Julian said, Hey, you know, I'd love to talk, blah, blah, blah. And, and Schiff goes, you're only going to talk if you're if you're over here in custody. And a lot of people responded in custody for what, Adam? Right. <laughs> um, you've never uh, there's no case, not been charged with anything. So we've got a U.S. congressman uh, just spouting off that some guy needs to be in jail and yet can't seem to tie a specific crime to that person. And so you, you can see through statements like that. And that's certainly not the only one out there. That, that this is political and that it's being driven by ideology rather than any sense of, of rule of law because um, by any standard in, in the rule of law, anything which really does would just be covered by the First Amendment. I'm not even sure if I agree entirely there because the Trump administration has been going after him too. I mean, Sessions said that arresting Julian is a priority for the administration. Pompeo said that they're a, uh, a non-state hostile intelligence <laughs> you know it's i think that it's it's less about party or ideology and more about you know the establishment and just people who have been exposed by him you know either <laughs> well I would, I would call i would call establishmentarianism in a sense an ideology in it in That's and of true. itself <laughs> fair enough um and so and it's and and you're right that it doesn't that this is something that spans both parties in many cases that, you know, there's, there's something and, and, and you've noticed it with certain people who have gone into the government now that when, uh, when they, you know, prior to that, they said, Oh, you know, I, they've shared out WikiLeaks articles or say, Hey, you guys got to look at this. Um, okay, not Pompeo, really but this, people, some other people. Yeah. And then you could, you could turn, and then they turn around and say, Oh, we're against WikiLeaks now. And it's like, wait, what did, what happened right there? Yeah. There, Pompeo had tweeted out WikiLeaks articles, and now they're, he's like, nope, they're enemy number yeah. one. And it's like, oh, really? Because like, you were totally fine with them when it was beneficial towards you. But that's the problem. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so, I mean, and that's, that's the other piece. And to talk about the 2016, the political impact of WikiLeaks, I mean, it, it certainly can't be understated. But what, what drives me... Um, 
so crazy and it makes me so confused is that while everyone constantly wants to talk about what the source of WikiLeaks was, um, as certainly in the, in the mainstream press, that nobody ever in the press there ever sits down and talks about the content of the emails. What was in the emails? What were these officials talking about? What were they discussing? Who were they meeting with? Um, you know, what, what emails, what things were they referencing, you know, and all the stuff that came of it. And then, I mean, you look at some of us who have just been maligned and smeared as rank conspiracy mongers and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I said, well, look, all we did was read your emails and said what was, and reported what was in there. So you can say you don't like our opinion of it and that's fine, or you don't like our coverage of it. But don't say that these people didn't say these things because I can read it right here. Right. So what, why do you think it's so important to protect his, his human rights, like Julian's human rights? Because he's, you know, currently in horrible conditions. I mean, we know that he's, you know, incommunicado. He's been isolated. He's essentially in solitary um what what do you think that we could be doing to support him and how do you what do you think about the human rights issue or the human rights aspect of this well the human rights aspect of it is important because again we've got a situation here where one person you know can essentially be held in exile be held in this form of detention with without trial without due process um, with based on accusations with no evidence and just as you said you know kind of a minute ago it's Julian Assange today but it could be your favorite paper tomorrow or it could be you tomorrow because we're living in a day and age now with social media whereby in the traditional rules of um, who is a media publisher and who isn't are very blurry because people now have access to social media. They have a massive reach on social media through, uh, through retweet sharing aggregation. And, and so one person, any random person with, you know, a Twitter account can suddenly have like the most popular tweet of a day, depending on what that tweet is, depending on what it is they put out. So let's say that something goes out that certain powers that be do not want seen. Well, now that person under this standard could be considered an enemy of the state, could be considered uh, someone who needs to be locked up just because they don't like what was reported. They don't like what was filmed. They don't like what was uh, what was set out. And so, you know, we, we actually had a meeting, uh, a friend of mine, this, this came up not too long ago in a sense where he said, hey, I'm in, I'm in this hotel in Paris and I see John Kerry meeting with a bunch of Iranians and they look like people from Iran's uh, foreign ministry. And this is right when uh, uh, the Iran nuke deal was kind of being renegotiated and eventually uh, scuttled. And he takes pictures of the whole thing. He's telling me about what's going on. He's tweeting about it. And then the next day it comes out, this is a smear campaign. This never happened. Kerry was there, but he didn't meet. And it's like, wait, no, no, no. We have the picture. See right here. This actually happened. And yet they all came after us for simply being in a hotel room and saying that, or no, a hotel uh, lobby and saying, this is something I saw, you know, see something, say something. So it sets a standard from a human rights perspective of how all of us could be treated if we find ourselves in a similar situation. And for someone to be, you know, shut up like this and to be isolated like this it's important for people and i think to raise awareness of it to continue to always do so peacefully and to use the strongest possible i i'm, I'm big into imagery i'm big into optics i know you call me a hippie but i'm not um it's because these are, the images, <laughs> these are the images that um that people see i mean imagine imagine a candlelight vigil outside the embassy there um where people are are holding candles and then also have duct tape over their mouths right. you know well, they, they images that will be shared pretty i mean the whole six years that he's been in there um there's been people who gathered really dedicated a few times a week outside the embassy um they're amazing and they've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff yeah yeah it's, and it's it's so important that people can see as well by the way 
um, that that's still going on because I guarantee you the governments see that that's going on and know that those people will be the first ones to call awareness should uh, you know, should something ever happen to the person in there, that those people are not going to forget about it. And so you're not just going to get away with, um, you know, uh, essentially putting a black bag over this guy's head and disappearing him. Right. I hate even thinking about that. It stresses me out. <laughs> yeah. The concept of that is just when, horrifying. when, I mean, when you look at it, look, I mean, these, 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 the governments have a, uh, you know, uh, numerous means by which they can, they can make someone disappear. Should they, should they choose to and that just is what it is and we don't want anyone to run afoul of that without if they haven't actually committed a crime you know if they haven't actually you know done something that was against the government um we would hope that those sorts of things would only be held for uh you know the the worst of the worst type of criminals but in this case you've got someone who uh, ran a blog yeah and it's i feel like the persecution of him just completely goes against everything that our founding fathers envisioned. Like when they wrote the first amendment, this is exactly what they had in mind. I mean, they talked about how having a free press was just the most important way to safeguard the citizen, like the average citizen against government corruption. And that's exactly what the point of all of it was. And I realize he's not from the U S so he's technically not covered under the first amendment, but I feel like as a nation, that should just be a, a principle that we uphold no matter what. It's something. So it's, it's, it's really actually, I mean, that's such a deep issue that you just touched on in the U S people don't understand how keep in mind. So, right. So the, the American revolution, right. Every revolutionary from George Washington to Thomas Paine to Thomas Jefferson, they were considered actual traitors because they fought a war against their own government, right? But prior to that, you had what were called the free pamphleteers. And I almost feel like the free pamphleteers, these guys making pamphlets, were basically community journalists, or speaking journalists, as they were today. People who just wrote things, bought their own printing presses, or went and paid for uh, for printers to print up their, their writings and had them spread throughout the colonies. That's where Thomas Paine's common sense, that was one of the most famous ones, came from. And he wasn't some, you know, uh, politician. He wasn't some, uh, you know, your famous writer, famous editor. He was just a guy who, who wanted to write because he thought it was the best thing to do to call out the government of his time to expose the corruption that was going on. And the founding fathers realized that it was so much the power of that free press. And that's literally where the word comes from, press, the printing press. Um, so they wanted freedom of that so that those ideas and that discussion would not be stifled and not be silenced so that the populace, the population could be informed in what they were doing and could make decisions based on that information for the good of everyone, for the greater good. But if you control the press, if you control what is printed, then you can control what people understand, you can control what people think, you can control how people act, you control how people behave. And so that power, they understood how important it was and they knew, and this is something that's so fascinating with the US Constitution is, you realize that the people who wrote about it, who wrote it, knew that politicians were corrupt. And that people in the future and further generations would try to corrupt the, their own government. So they wrote it in a pers from a perspective of we need to find ways to stop those people in the future from being corrupt by giving power to individuals, giving power to people, allowing them to still do this. And John Adams had this great quote. I said this at the Deplorable um, that when he said, when people talk about the revolution they they usually talk about the war but the war wasn't the revolution the war was just the symptom of the revolution so the real revolution took place in the hearts and minds of ordinary men and women that was the revolution it was there was the thought revolution that and he's referring to the revolution that was instituted by the freedom of the press by people having these ideas and discussing them and then collectively deciding okay we are going to have our own country. So it's it's amazing. America would not exist. It's it's not just it's our, our idea. We literally would not exist as a place on the on the map. We'd all be, you know, just British colonies still. 
if it were not for freedom of the press. That is how important this issue is to the United States of America. And that is how this important this issue is for our world. Off my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, I mean, going back to how you're talking about how the government will have journalists that like do their dirty work, Thomas Jefferson actually warned of that like exactly. He said that the government always keeps a standing army of news writers to print whatever they needed yep. printed. And that the people having the freedom of press is what safeguards them and like makes it so that the truth can get out. And Thomas Jefferson, I actually recently read about extensively, um, he was the target of fake news all the time. And Thomas Jefferson hated newspapers. It's yeah, so funny that people don't get this. He, also said, he, he said that like he said that like he would rather um what was it? He said that he would rather have a world with or a, a country with no government yeah. than no newspaper newspapers. Than no newspapers. Even though he yeah. hated the press because they trashed him all the time. But he still believed so deeply in the freedom of press that he said he would rather have no government than no newspapers. And I think that's such an important thing to remember because you know, what they're doing right now is they want there to just be the standing army of news writers that are government employed. And that goes against everything that our nation was founded on. It's really a shame. It's pretty upsetting. And we, see it these days. we see it certainly. Um, I, I would definitely point out in the company of Amazon and Jeff Bezos, where it's like Amazon is trying so hard to be a, like the fifth branch of government. Um, and it's really creepy because, and, but then you you see Bezos, he's, he's got a, a $500 million contract with the CIA to hold, to host their cloud computing. Um, now they're talking about getting one with DOD, but then on the other hand, he went and purchased the Washington post, which is, right. which had been seen as one of the most, um, wide widely read uh respected you know um newspapers or at least not legacy newspapers it's sort of the paper of record for washington dc and then they just purchased it <laughs> and right. and so now you've got this company that's with one of the richest men in the world uh one of the most powerful country companies in the world who you know treats their workers off just horribly they're peeing in bottles in the factories and in trash cans and and he's own owning this mouthpiece which is and turning into essentially propaganda for himself propaganda for cia um and they, they the just, opposite they of a free up. press i you mean you can't be a free press and be paid by the government it just no doesn't it doesn't work, work it doesn't work that way that's it why we possibly work that way so badly like wikileaks is just unfiltered truth and it's the most important thing i think in modern history, I, I firmly believe that we're going to read about how great Julian was in history books one day. <laughs> oh, it's definitely, I mean, when there's a section on how the media changed and how ordinary people became more powerful than legacy media, I mean, you, you can't think of a name who's more well known. You can't think of a name who's, who's going to be more influential in this or was more out there before anyone else. Than, than Julian Assange. I mean, it's he was one of the people that that first came and started doing this. Um, and I think that in a way and of itself was very shocking to a lot of people. And they didn't quite understand who he was because this was this was like during the blogosphere, you know, sort of internet 1.0 era where individuals didn't really exist on the internet yet. The internet was just kind of a thing. Um, but now everyone does it right now. Everybody's got a blog. Now everybody's writing their own material and people love it. And so it's, it's one of those things where a guy was singled out because he was just ahead of where everybody else was going. Right. And I mean, uh, like all these websites now, like Washington post, New York times, they all have forms where you can anonymously submit leaks to right. them, which is exactly the WikiLeaks model. You know, it's even better. They're even better. The model and trashing the people that they stole the, the concept from. It's I actually, um, I went. We went back when I was doing that Sarah Palin thing. We went back and looked up um, Washington Post's uh, uh, tweets on from it. They made they a whole Twitter account. <laughs> yeah. So, so Washington Post goes, "Hey, WikiLeaks just put out a brand new dump on Sarah Palin's emails. Do you guys want to help us sift through them? Click." 
WikiLeaks at Washington Post. And it's like, what? Yeah. Could you imagine them? So this was, that was what, eight years ago? Imagine, or seven years ago. Imagine them now coming out and saying, wow, these Podesta emails are really important. Do you want to help the Washington Post come out? You know, right. Well, we had CNN saying that it was illegal for people to look at WikiLeaks, which was yeah, an Chris Cuomo. Um, Chris <laughs> They're Cuomo, like, you can't look at it, but we can look at it. Like the rules for journalists are a little different. So, you know, we can look at it, but it's stolen property. And so you can't look at it the same. And he just like, he just like flexes in front of the camera and expects, expects people to just kind of take whatever he says. Yeah. The absurdity of the way that WikiLeaks is covered is really just the most hypocritical thing in the media right now. Well, and they flip, they, they completely flip back and forth. Like the left, I guess, or, or, or sort of the left side of the press was enthralled with WikiLeaks when they were going after the Bush administration or when uh, when the Iraq war was going on. And so, wow, it was, you know, champions, freedom of the press and everything. And then after Snowden and then up until the DNC and uh, and uh, the Podesta emails, now now suddenly it's it's completely flipped. And that person who was seen as this hero and champion and, and lion among men is now a, par- a social pariah and um, from justice and someone who needs to be shut down as an enemy. And it's it's amazing to see how quickly people change their stance because of politics, not because of any you know personal principles of their own, of which they have none. Right. That's why this stream is making me really happy, though. Like, this vigil is amazing. There's people from all over the political spectrum who stuck with WikiLeaks and care about the truth. And I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. I think we're actually outnumbered from, by the left <laughs> on this. And you wouldn't think that it, it would be that way, you know. But there are a lot of people who still have principles and are sticking to them. And it's, it's great. I love that it's... A, across the whole political spectrum there are people who care about the truth still gives me hope (laughs) exactly and i mean i i would come at it from a perspective of you know i've never been able to get anyone to just answer for me that simple question is how can you say that what's being done here is illegal when the new york times and washington post publish classified information, publish inside information, publish leaked information every single day. Every single day. And you've been doing it for 30, 40 years. They just had a movie about it. It was like a Steven Spielberg movie with, uh, um, I think Tom Hanks was in it and, and uh, Meryl Streep and nominated for an Oscar. All about leaking classified information through the Washington Post, the New York Times, and during, during Vietnam, Pentagon Papers. And putting it out there. So again, it it's the double thing on this is it's it's so much pretzel logic, Cassandra, that you know I almost threw out one of my uh, I almost threw out one of my brainial hemispheres just trying to think about this because I don't even know how they can how they can say that one deserves an Oscar and deserves Pulitzer prizes and the other one should put you in jail because well and we get it because one was done to a Republican one was done to a Democrat and people in the U.S understand now that that's what the rules are and not to get into that too much but you know if you're a democrat everything you do is praiseworthy if you're republican if you do the same thing you're condemned right i mean they've been after wikileaks since the iraq and afghan war logs came out which was against bush i i honestly think it's more of a, a you know deep state or establishment than so that's more of a i would say it's a neoconservative thing and if you if you track the neoconservatives and their path through um, through the halls of power, you can track their vendetta against Julian at the same way. So the neoconservatives controlled D.C. for a very long time, probably since the end of the end of the Reagan era, really. Um, uh, so from from Bush 41 on until Trump, it was the neoconservatives controlling D.C. But after they left after Bush, they basically said, look, we need to stay in power so they gravitated to barack obama and so many people saw how deeply uh, tied to the cia that the barack obama administration was and then you would see in 2016 those same quote-unquote republicans like bill crystal david petraeus and others instead of supporting donald trump for president they were actually all supporting hillary clinton because she adhered 
to that neoconservative ideology. She adhered to that ideology of um, sort of American expansionism, that America must protect the, in their, in their words, by the way, America must protect uh, the new order in the world, the American empire, um, you, you know, control our interests abroad. And as we all know, the President Trump ran against those sorts of, of ideals. He, he said, no, I want to focus on problems at home. I want to focus on the way our, our people are hurting, the way our economy is hurting. I don't care if something is going on in the world that we shouldn't necessarily commit troops to that just because we don't like it. What we should do is keep people and their families here safe because that's our job as a government. And so fighting this group or, or opposing this group of neoconservatives isn't necessarily a partisan thing because they've switched sides so many times, but you can always, you can always tell someone by their enemies. And you notice it's always this same group of people that calls Julian Assange an enemy. Sure. It's, it's really a shame because he's, he's standing up for the people more than any other any other publisher, any other reporter. It's, we've learned more from Julian than all of the legacy media combined. And, and WikiLeaks has only been around for 10 years. I mean, they've, they've released more secrets, more scoops, more, you know, just historic, massive documents. So, so I had to sit, all right, I'll, I'll give you an example of what you're saying in contrast. I had to sit in the White House Correspondents Association dinner a couple of weeks ago where they gave CNN, where they literally gave CNN, Jim Shuto, um, Jake Tapper, and others, uh, Evan Perez and uh, Manu Rajo, I think, a an award for publishing the dossier, the Trump dossier. They're like, oh, we've got this this amazing story, and it was great Pulitzer, and they they and they give this uh, um, you know award to CNN for publishing the dossier, which is like completely unverified that people have had to issue so many uh, you know things over it was just handed to them right but then these same people turn around and ignore all of the journalism that wikileaks has done all of the scoops that have come out of wikileaks and not not only ignore them but condemn them for publishing stories that are 10 times what this op- okay congratulations you you uh, you broke the story that Hillary Clinton had an opposition research file on Trump. Not exactly, you know, not exactly um, mind blowing stuff there that she paid for. But uh, in this case, when we have actual journalism being done by this, you know, there was one thing that always got me was um, the Panama Papers when that came out, and I said, "Why is nobody talking about this story? This story that implicates everyone, almost so many world leaders." Um, world leaders of Europe, world leaders of America, um, all different hemispheres. People had to resign. Um, Prime ministers had to resign over this story. But in the mainstream press, it was barely talked about. It was barely even given a moment's notice. And so that, in my mind, and as I talked about before, you know, how I kind of came on my journey was one of the things that just didn't make any sense to me as as a critical thinking, empathetic human. And led me to understand that there are essentially two two forms of media now there's establishment media media and there's independent media and establishment media is always going to adhere to a certain type of line a certain type of narrative and independent media is going to do whatever they want to do because people are different and they're going to have different takes on things they're going to have different opinions on things and that is so much more valuable to me as a consumer of news and that is so much more interesting to me to hear ideas being discussed and debated and, and options being discussed and debated than a group of people that's constantly saying the same thing all the time. And we actually had, there was a, a meeting that William Craddock of, of Disobedient Media published, the, uh, posted the video of and called it out, where there's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations um, who is a former Obama administration guy, and he was sort of the um, Department of Public Advocacy in State Department. And he was the chief and he said, my, well, he said, as a he, he just says, it. he's just saying this in a speech that, well, you know, I kind of joked that my job was chief propagandist of the administration. And I think that all governments have to push domestic propaganda for their own population so that we can set a master narrative so that we can push that master narrative throughout the population. And that's better for everyone. And everyone on the panel just sits there and nods and agrees with him. 
And and I'm watching and saying, well, he, he, you know, he just said, did he actually just say that in 2018? Did he just, he just said that council for like, <laughs> and then there's a guy in the audience uh, who is, uh, and I can't tell where, but from his accent, it sounds like he's from an African nation. And, and he says, he says, yes, but what happens when those narratives are pushed onto the third world countries and we're trying to tell the truth, but you guys are, you know, cutting that down with your narrative. And he says, hey, off and he says oh well you know that's not you know that's not the man and that's the end of the panel and then they all kind of just clap and walk off one of those things and it's amazing um there was another one not too long ago i think uh zero hedge had it up in the same article where they went to a state department spokesman and i want to say this was even um august of 2017 so it was during trump administration uh, i don't know who the guy was he was probably you know state department still just State Department, they're they're as deep as it goes in terms of deep state, and they go to the guy and say, "Hey, yeah, so you guys are always attacking Iran uh, for their elections, but why don't you ever call out Saudi Arabia on their lack of elections and lack of democracy?" Right. Have you seen this? The guy just sits there. He turns, and he stares off into blank space for like twenty seconds of dead air. Just. And then he comes back to the mic and he says something about Iran's human rights record is bad and we have to go. <laughs> and and he walks off. And it's like, these are basic, simple questions that any free thinking, critical thinking, empathetic human could ask and would want to know is... And, Look, all the guy had to say was, we see Saudi Arabia as an ally and we don't see Iran as an ally, right? It's like, that would be the honest thing to say. Any, anyone could say that. And it's, it's pretty obvious in terms of US government policy. So why can't you just say that is our policy? We are going into alliance with them and not them. Because right. that would cause them. But the reason they won't do that, the reason they won't ever do that is because they will always adhere to the master narrative. And the master narrative in terms of US policy is everything the US does is because it's morally good and it's the moral high ground. Um, and that you can't ever just do something because you view it as um, real politic and say, hey, we're getting in bed with these guys. We don't want to be in bed with those guys. They'll never admit it. They'll never give up the master narrative. And it was amazing to see the length to which this guy would go to try to uphold that narrative in a way that he just wasn't even prepared for. And so that's why that's why those people have discredited them this, themselves. That's why media that plays into that line, those, as you said, those um, the standing army of government sponsored newspapermen and women um, have discredited themselves so far, because now that we have new outlets, now that we have alternative independent media that we can read, that we can see, that we can have easy access to. That's why their power doesn't work anymore. That's why their stories are debunked within seconds. That's why they're um their false narratives are diffused so quickly remember the term fake news when it came out was supposed to be used on alternative media it was supposed to be used against independent media but it totally backfired for them and now it's just being used against them mercilessly and i couldn't it's another another thing that i love about julian and WikiLeaks so much is they promote outlets like disobedient media who's doing amazing reporting but wouldn't have that kind of reach. Like he really, truly has done so much for independent journalists and even beyond providing so much content for people to go through, he, he really promotes everyone. And that's so important too. And I, I think that yeah, it I was having a discussion with, it. um, I was, I was actually talking to, uh, to William Craddock about this yesterday and we, we sort of had an at length discussion of, um, so not to name names, but I got into a little a little internet tiff with someone over crediting disobedient media for breaking a story. Um, but it was it's a story that's now gone on and become sort of worldwide, world world famous. And and I went back and just said, hey, don't forget to include disobedient media. They were one of the first ones that broke the story that this this you know blog. And it was um, Elizabeth Leah Voss who had had written the story. It wasn't even any of us. But I just said, hey, you know, credit where it's due. That's, I'm, I'm a big eye on that. And I just got yelled at. I got sniped at by people for, for bringing that up. And, and it reminded me, and I was talking to William about it, and I had a, 
it reminded me of a line that someone told me, I think Paul Joseph Watson said it to me very early on uh, when I started getting involved in media, I'd say about a year and a half ago. And he said, Jack, you can figure out pretty quickly who's in this for the message and who's in this for the, themselves. And they will expose themselves very quickly because you can see that number one, they will never give other people credit for things. Uh, and number two, if you ever call them out on it, they just turn into a complete hothead. And so it's very interesting to see that, and that's just a completely different aspect of, 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 of Julian, but that he has always been willing to build up other people because I think he realizes it too. He realizes that he doesn't want to just be the only person doing all of this, that he wants other people to start waking up and to teach people how to do what he does and to teach people how to run organizations to expose corruption because this is the ideal, right? More information is always better. A more informed populace always leads to better outcomes for everyone, more understanding, more, more uh, um, cooperation. I mean, if you go back and look at the world wars, how many of those would have been prevented if more people had just understood what was going on, had, had actually had discussions you know, directly instead of giving into propaganda all the time. So that's, I think, something that's been a big part of, of his work. And I've, I've always noticed that and I've always appreciated that. Uh, sorry, I, I was reading something on the screen. Um, yeah, it's, it is really important to build people up. I mean, you can't do everything on your own. And people like him who really use their platform for boosting everyone else are absolutely so important to this whole thing. And people always credit him for like the leaks and things like that. But I really think that we need to appreciate yeah, how much he does to build everybody up. And yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm I, mean, I was in the middle of reading like a long paragraph somebody just sent me. <laughs> um, no, plus it's early and you've been up a bit. But no, it's you're, you're exactly right. Because at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> look, I, I don't want to be doing this the rest of my life. You know, I've got I've got I've got a family. I've got kids. Um, we 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 can't just we are up against billionaires. We are up against trillionaires in some cases we are up against the most powerful forces on the face of the planet so and there are so few of us there are so few of us um that when i see people and have situations like the one i had yesterday where people are going back and forth over you know egos and you know having territory guys there's so much fertile ground out there there are so many stories that aren't being reported there are so many other things you could be doing that why do we take down our own? Why do we go after each other when we could really be building our, we're not going to agree on every issue. All right, get over it, you know, but it's, there are so few of us. We have zero backbench. You said that the other day, we have zero backbench. We're so narrow that, and guess what? There are no reinforcements coming. There are no, there's no cavalry. There's no, um, you know, there's nobody we can call in for air support. It's, this is it. This is all we got. And so that's why, I just want to thank you for inviting me on this stream and, and for holding it and everyone who's on the stream and everyone for holding it because um, it's it's so important to show that there is a, a network being formed. There is a community being formed of free thinking people who want to come out there to see truth exposed, to hold people in power accountable for their actions and, and for their, their misdeeds and to let the people of the world actually know what's going on behind closed doors. And now through the internet, through the power of social media and all the other uh, medias that we have out there, we're actually able to make so much more of an impact that we don't need the legacy press anymore. We don't need that standing army of journalists that they, you know, even though they have money, they have institutionalization, they have, you know, unlimited resources, that because they don't have the truth on their side, they will ultimately fail until they change their ways. Agreed. <laughs> They're going to keep failing and we're going to keep winning. <laughs> I mean, not us personally. Yeah, which is why you see, by the way, and, and not to go off too much of a tangent, but which is why you see them now going after people's families, doxing and uh, 
you know, trying to get people fired from jobs who have anonymous accounts and things like this, because it, they, they see it as warfare in a sense. They see it as information warfare. And I, I, my gosh, you know, whatever happened to, you know, just telling the truth and debating ideas. And now it's, you know, they, they try to tear down individuals. They try to tear down families. They're going after my family. Um, they're going after uh, numerous people's families right now. And I just, it, it blows my mind uh, to see this happening. But then on the same side, those, those same, you know, legacy journalists calling themselves, oh, well, this is just, this is just regular journalism. There's nothing, nothing strange about what we're doing. This is, you know, totally commonplace, la, la, la. Blows my mind. Yeah. This, reporting- this be red alert, you know, screaming alarm bells levels of nobody trusts you anymore. And then when they go do stuff like Gawker, that it just, it just makes it so much worse. It's true. Uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's, I remember when journalists used to be like held in the highest regard for exposing government corruption. Now it's like a pissing contest on who can dox who or take down this random civilian. I mean, Julian yeah. doing like the big things and they're like squabbling over somebody who has a big Twitter account. <laughs> like he's actually right. trying to like hold power to account. And that used to be celebrated so hard. And I really wish that we could get back to that. I mean, I, I believe that our founding fathers would have thrown a parade and made it a holiday <laughs> like for Julian. And yeah, now we just have people talking about how many scoops of ice cream the president ate. <laughs> it's like, it's down to one. He's going on a diet. It's down to one. It's down to one. Good. good to know. And and the the hamburgers. I haven't had this confirmed that, but it's out there in, in in reporting that that when they're they're taking one bun off of his Big Mac, so he's getting yeah. one. The, I guess the under bun, not the over bun, because you you couldn't eat, you couldn't eat it the other way. Then you'd have to hold the hamburger. Why would you want to do that? So you've got to you've got to get the under bun, and then because then you can hold the lettuce. Like I wouldn't mind holding the lettuce, right? Because the lettuce it's it's not like juicy, but um. <laughs> Jack, <laughs> no, I'm serious. That that was an actual CNN report this this week. Caitlin Collins had it that that President Trump. I'm I'm not making this up. <laughs> that he's taking one bun off of his hamburgers now in effort to go on a diet. And it's I'm just not. sitting there like, this is what you want to do with your life. This is the kind of information that you feel is the most important to be brought to the American people. How many hamburger buns on his hamburger? He's is he eating the full bun or not? Really, it's like. Who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, this is why I got into journalism. This is why the First Amendment was written by our founding fathers. To tell me how many buns of, of a Big Mac the President of the United States is eating. Yes, this is what, how I want to be remembered in history. Written on my tombstone in the textbooks of every schoolhouse in America. The President ate half a Big Mac. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I'll be watching a news report and something stupid like that will come on and I'm just like, wow. Then we have like the real journalists locked up in an embassy. <laughs> and actually, actually, uh, I want to say that they got called out pretty heavily for that one because it was right after he announced um, the the reopening of the, the North Korea summit. And that, that's what, that was the CNN headline at the same time. So on one station, they had North Korea summit back on the other station. <laughs> President Trump eats half of Big Mac. <laughs> and it's like, who, who's reporting actual news? Yeah, that's insane. I, I don't, I try to avoid cable news at this point because it's horrid, but. Except for one American news, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's talk more about why you like Julian <laughs> and why you've been so outspoken about supporting him. I guess. Well, so I kind of found myself in an interesting position last May. So a little over a year ago um, when I essentially did the Macron leak. So I found myself in a position where I had received information or found or information, I should say, on the a candidate for president of France, right? Um, it was Emmanuel Macron. And I've been looking on poll on 4chan for 
someone had basically told me, hey, there's going to be a document dump of, of, you know, stuff to come out on this guy on, on Friday. And it was like this specific, specific Friday. So I was traveling that day. I was going down to Miami. I was with you, actually. We I met you in Miami. And um, I spent the whole day, like, I'm on the flight. I bought the Wi-Fi. And I'm, I'm just hitting refresh. I'm hitting refresh. I get to um, the apartment we were staying. I'm just sitting there hitting refresh. The girls were like, do you want to go out? Do you want to get something? It was like uh, Tanya and Fake Goldie. And I said, no, no, I'm just going to right here. You guys go just give me a burger or something. I'll be here. Um, I ate the whole burger, by the way, not just half, because I know that's the important part of the story. Um, and finally it popped in, it said massive document dump, Emmanuel Macron, thousands of emails. And I said, oh, let's look at this. And boom, it was a, it was a link to a torrent file, which had uh, thousands of emails on Emmanuel Macron and uh, his campaign, what they were doing, what they weren't doing, people they were talking to. And it was all in French. So I, I just, I suddenly felt for myself that, that moment of, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, doing this. And I don't think anyone else has this yet. And so I, I went and I got him verified through a, uh, a, a very close friend of mine who works in cybersecurity, who actually was at a conference for cybersecurity. So they looked at the whole thing and they said, yeah, Jack, this is, you know, this is completely accurate. These are real. This is verified. Um, then I was trying to get people in France to translate it for me. And this is like three days before the French election. And then eventually I had to leave. So I just put, went up and put a post and said, Hey, looks like a huge document dump hashtag Macron leaves. And then I left and I was gone for like an hour going to film this event and interview people. And I'm at the event and probably about an hour or two later. And I wasn't even on my phone cause I was, you know, working that someone goes, hey man, did you hear what Pasovic did? Did you hear this? And I see this group of people talking, Pasovic's got this thing, it's on Drudge, whatever. I'm like, no, what did Pasovic do? And, and he says, he's, he's got all these documents, Emmanuel Macron's leaked the emails, it's all over Drudge. I said, really? And, and I, he shows me Drudge Report and there's like me on Drudge Report with the Macron leaks. And you know, then I go back to my phone and of course it's like, million calls and texts that I haven't responded mostly from my boss um, <laughs> at the time. And, you know, I found myself in that position where there were people who were at one side saying, this is amazing. How did you do this? And there were people on the other side who were upset about it saying, this guy is a foreign agent. This guy is some kind of internet um, propagandist, uh, uh, provocateur, everything else. And uh, in my head, I'm thinking, well, all I did is share out a couple of links, man. That's, that's literally all I did. I didn't even, you know, I went back and looked at my original tweet and it didn't even have over a thousand retweets, <laughs> you know, like for me, that's not really like something that's gone viral, but it, uh, it was one of those situations where suddenly I was hit with this massive wave of, accusations and and disparagements of people calling me this and people calling me that and and then myself knowing the truth of this i found something on the internet and directed people to do it that's all all that that that's the truth of it and i've i've never been able to um go back and dig because it's an anonymous you know uh board so I, I don't know where it came from and i said wow this must be kind of what Julian feels like when, when he's in one of those situations where he's gotten, you know, something. And all I want is for people, all I would hope is that people would go in and read the information and read it for themselves and get to know what was going on and translate it and all. And yet instead, the reaction of the, a lot of the mainstream press, specifically in France, Le Mans, was to attack me, was to attack my wife, was to create these elaborate you know conspiracies and discussions of like who i was and my background and and it, it said this must be what it feels like in, in a very small way a very small way when julian is on the receiving end of that um because then when you're in those shoes yourself and when you're feeling it and when you're seeing it and you're telling people the truth about what happened and in some cases even even showing people the steps of the truth like like I, at one point i had a journalist and i like showed him my laptop and I said, this is what I did. 
I went here, I went here, I went here. And they just don't believe you. And they just still write whatever they want to write. And they still push their own narrative of, of falsehoods against you, where I say, my gosh, you know, what, what is this thing that we're up against? What it, who is really, um, you know, directing these people to say these things? And where is it all coming from in this sense? Because I just, I don't get it. And, um, and, then, and, then I, and then I thought about Julian and I thought, wow. <laughs> and then if I'm getting it over just one thing, imagine how they treat this guy and imagine what I've heard about this guy. And my gosh, that must be, you know, 10 times, 100 times as false as how they treated me. So I get it. I get it. Do you have any suggestions for people moving forward and how they can speak out to, or what they can do to stand with Julian or attempt to help the situation? Any ideas <laughs> besides the candle vigil? Well, so the optics, optics is great. Optics is always amazing. Um, you want to also seek, um, you want to seek allies and governments as much as you can. Find people who are willing, and I know it's crazy and I know it sounds hard, but there are actually people in government. Um, they may not be the most powerful people, and sometimes they are the most powerful people, um, but they may not, they may kind of have their hands tied when they're the most powerful people. Um, seek out allies, seek out people who are willing to listen to your side of things, seek out people who view his fight as a noble fight. and use their leadership and you leverage their influence and ability to move forward on these issues to look for a way to come forward and when it comes down to it like like we said a million times this is an issue of press freedom and if you if you if you state it in that sense it's very hard for people to say that they're against it and it's very hard for people to crack down on it and so look all we're looking for is you know in in one case it might be something where there's a proposal for, um, in a sense, press freedoms as applied to the digital age. And this is something where in a society, we're in such a transition point right now that a lot of laws that are on the books, a lot of um, legal structure that's on the books in terms of case law that's, that's taken place, it doesn't apply, shield laws is a great example. They don't apply very well to online publishers to online publishing to digital rights and it's a case where as a lawmaker someone could probably find an area of being dare i say it progressive actually progressive and writing new laws that bring new norms into line with the legal and regulatory structure of government and this isn't just an american thing this could happen all over the world i really truly believe that the next big rights battle um, that we're going to see isn't necessarily one of um, any type of, of, of you know, gender or um, ethnicity, but it's going to be digital rights. It's going to be that sort of digital online rights. And we're seeing this very much in terms of identity. We're seeing this very much in terms of data and how people's private data is being sold and shared on the open market. And believe me, those are trillion dollar markets. Um, this is also an idea of what people can and can't do online and how that will affect them in their own lives, in their personal lives. I think that that's also part of digital rights. Do you have the digital right to do this? Do you have the digital right to do that? Um, I know that some people were calling it at one point, we're, we're calling for sort of an internet bill of rights. Um, and so I think that's something that really needs to be looked at and where this type of activity should also be included in that to say, look, you may not have gone to, uh, you know, NYU School of Journalism or, you know, Harvard, whatever, but that doesn't make you any less of a journalist. You're anyone, anyone can be a journalist or a reporter if they have an internet connection and a smartphone. And so there have to be ways where that is governed and have to be ways where that is um, regulated, at least from, you know, a government standpoint, where it's equitable for all citizens because just because you you film something and put it online shouldn't be grounds for you to go to jail right. shouldn't be grounds for you to be locked up and that's a situation where many countries have 
old laws that do not reflect new realities. Sure. All right. Well, I think we're going to be bringing Susie on pretty soon. Amazing. Thank you for joining. And if we got to come on it. If there's anything else that you want to say or throw in there. Um, well, I think I would, I would also just say to people is, you know, keep hopeful, keep up the, up the, you know, the, the fight, um, politically and peacefully always use peaceful protest, always use peaceful optics, always, you know, never be the other side, never be what the other side says about you. Um, never be your, your fight, your fake Wikipedia page, right? Um, always be better, always have that ability to, to rise above. And when you do that, um, the people who hate you will see it, right? And that's why they hate Julian so much because he really is just a very polite, you know, well-mannered, well-spoken guy. Um, and it's never really called for the overthrow of anything. He's just said, I want people to know what's going on. And he, um, yeah. I've, I've is never there, seen him. Is there anything that you, I mean, obviously Julian has no internet or anything right now, but it, what would you say to Julian if you had a chance to talk to him? Uh, or you should give him a message of encouragement right now or, you know. Yeah, mainly, dude. Okay, so if you're going to watch a DVD series while you're in there, don't pick Game of Thrones. I'm telling you, it's just going to it's it's going to be the worst. I know people give it a lot of props, but tell me there are so many better things to do with your time. Stick to the books. Julian, don't watch the show. Stick to the books. But no, in all seriousness. Um, you ran a Game of Thrones Twitter account. <laughs> And blog. I did, yeah. I was the angry GOT fan. Well, that was my whole idea, too, is I wanted to expose the truth of the books of the Game of Thrones series against the horrible, uh, disgusting TV show. I see. But, yeah, I, I don't even know if he has access to, to DVDs and shows. I mean, he's, he's got to be able to get something. Um, but it's, no, it's, it's. hey, they, they did this to Solson Nietzsche, too, man. They did, they did this to so many, uh, you know, this is, you are in the line of dissidents who have been locked up for political purposes that stretches back for a time as, as we've had governments. Um, and in the end, regardless of what happened, your legacy will be of that. You were someone who spoke out against the wrongs you saw in your time. And does it mean you were perfect? Does it mean you never made a mistake in your life? No, of course not, no one is. But just because, just because people aren't perfect, that doesn't mean that ideas and goals can't be perfect. Perfect, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Let you get out of here and get back to the baby. All now we see you later. Have a <laughs> Thank good day. You. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. Just before Jack bails, I just want to say that is one cute baby, and that was so so beautiful to see. Thank you. Yeah, ra raising him right, raising him right, <laughs> <laughs> as right as we can at least. It's awesome. <laughs> and we're gonna teach him to tell the truth too, when as he gets older. So there you go, Cass. That's a great. That's a great point. Just teach him to tell the truth. All right, guys. Everybody can go to WikiLeaks shop and get that infant shirt, by the way.